Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for stopping by. Uh, my name is Rayo. I'm currently a bioinformatics programmer at UCSF. Um, title of my talk is going to be on enhancing reproducibility in immunogenetics, but it's going to be more about how I personally leverage containerization on bioinformatics workflows. Um, so I work uh, for the Hall and Bach lab at UCSF. Um, our lab focuses on understanding the contribution of genetic region like HLA or MHC um, into different types of diseases, um, specifically like autoimmune or immune disease. Um, but today's talk is not necessarily going to be about the science of behind immunogenetics or the tools that are associated and trying to understand um, these big questions, these big science questions. But I'm going to tackle more on the reproducibility issues that the scientific community is currently facing. Um, and I also just wanted to preface the talk by acknowledging that there's actually not a lot of novelty on what I'm presenting today. Um, I think my main hope for this talk is that I can raise the awareness um, for developers to think about how can we make our tools more accessible and reduce the barrier of entry um, when it comes to containerizing your workflow. Um, I'm sure some of you are already familiar with the idea and I guess I just wanted to break it down further so that it's, um, it's not as foreign as we think it is. So I kind of want to start off with um, this survey that was done back in 2016 where Nature surveyed um, 1,500 scientists asking them whether there is a reproducibility crisis. And to my surprise, over half of them, 52% of them mentioned that, yes, there is a significant and a crisis in science. And this is when it comes to recreating an experiment, reproducing a data or generating a figure, knowing what reagent to use, et cetera. Um, and so there just goes to show that there is a big problem um, with reproducibility in, in science. And just to showcase that issue in computational um, biology specifically, the NLM, the National Li Library of Medicine, hosted a workshop back in 2020 where they invited 25 trainees in groups of five to recreate a figure from a published bioinformatics paper. And surprisingly, none of them were able to reproduce the image, even though they have been given the necessary um, input for that particular pipeline. And just to put this in a bigger context, um, there has been attempts to assess how well we are doing um, in keeping computational science reproducible. And so I'm not going to go into each of this, but these studies basically um, try to run pipeline that are publicly available to see what percentage of like how many of them are actually runnable from one end to the other. So I'm just going to showcase the one on the on the most right here out of um, out of all the pipelines that they tested on the Harvard Dataverse R script, only about a quarter of them is actually uh, runnable from, from end to end. And so there, there can be many reasons why, you know, we, we're facing such a complex issue, right? It's, it's such a big problem. And one of the main reasons is because it's actually really complex, but mathematics pipelines are complicated. You utilize multiple tools, typically tested on a very specific version, um, and it's usually dependent on what's the operating system um, of the developer. And so one way to potentially address this issue is um, by specifying the requirements. You know, you've probably seen some of this on some of the GitHub repos that you've um, encountered in the past few years. You can specify, you know, what tools you use, what version, um, how do you install them, et cetera. But, you know, it's, it's not always simple. Um, sometimes when you try to uh, install our packages, you need certain libraries installed and those system packages or libraries are typically installed through um, your package manager like yum or apt and they usually want you to have root access or, or sudo access. And so that brings me to um, this idea of containerization, which I'm sure most of you are already familiar with but I'm just going to give you a, a very brief overview it, is that containers um, packs um, every single tool, packages, and dependencies that you would like your users to have. So it will remove the complexity that comes along with your um, tools or your pipelines installation. And for the container platform that I choose, I actually decided to uh, settle on Singularity. This was a tool developed by the um, by folks over at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. 
um, which means it's, you know, it's meant for reproducibility in scientific computing. And one reason why I think Singularity is such a nice option is that it stores container in a single file, in a single SIF file um, that is easily shareable. Now, at this point, some of you might be thinking, why don't you just use Docker? You know, it's been around longer. I think it's more popular. Um, it's probably used by a lot of software engineers all around the world. And the main reason why I picked Singularity over Docker is because Singularity is designed to run, to be run as a non-privileged user. And this is especially helpful if you're working in an HPC cluster in a high performance computing platform. For instance, in UCSF, we use what's called Quinten, where it's like a shared resource. Um, everybody in, in the campus basically are allowed to access them. People over at UBC might be familiar with ARC, um, the Advanced Research Computing. People over at Berkeley, you might be familiar with Savio. Um, UNSW, you might know Katana. So this HPCs, they typically don't let you have pseudo or root access, which makes um, Singularity just a more appealing option um, compared to Docker. And just wanted to showcase one of the pipelines that we containerized in the past is what we call uh, Ping. It stands for pushing immunogenetics to the next generation. Um, I have no idea who came up with the naming, but I think it's pretty creative. Um, it is a tool that would let you um, do genotyping for the key region from short read sequencing data. Um, and it's just short read pair and sequencing data. And I'm not gonna talk um, too much about the actual pipeline itself. Um, what I wanted to highlight now is actually the three tools um, that are critical in this pipeline. And most of you are probably, have probably worked with uh, one of these three tools before, or maybe all of them. And so now I kind of just wanted to walk us through the process of uh, how do I create a container with these three tools? Just, you know, just a very simple, basic container. Um, and you can actually do it by um, instructing um, the container by specifying, by letting them know what package you want installed and what version you want it to have in what's called the definition file. So typically I just have the definition file sitting in, in my uh, GitHub. Um, it's similar to a Docker file for those of you who are familiar um, with the Docker system. And essentially this is just like a, a text file. And if we go inside the definition file, you're gonna look, um, it's gonna look something like this where I, I set it into two different parts. So the first part is to set up the environment and the dependencies. Um, it, you can install tools that would help you ensure proper installation of your further of other bioinformatics tools. So this would be, th this would be things like wget, um, make, um, visit to, so you know, extracting, getting all the tools, etc. Um, you also would want to install libraries or system packages that are needed for bioinformatics um, tool installation. So in this particular case, um, lib tbb dev, um, this is needed for bow tie. Um, and so these are the kind of things that you want to take care of before you send off your tool or publish your tool to the users so that you know potential investigators or users who are interested in your pipeline, they don't necessarily need to install all these different packages. You know, we, we're just trying to make their life easier. Um, and the second part of the definition file is probably something that you're more familiar with. This is where you actually get the tool, extract them, and then make the tool itself. Um, and these two parts that I break it, broke it down into, it's just the more important chunk of the definition file. There is more, but I'm not going to go over everything. Um, but the in, in, in essence is that you can just specify um, your system packages, and then you can specify what actual bioinformatics tools do you want to have installed in the in your container itself. Once you already have your definition file, um, the next step is actually to build the container. So building the container means you want to get this CIF file. So this is the actual container file that I was mentioning earlier. Why I like Singularity is that it's just one singular file that tells you, hey, hey this is the, the exact container. Um, and the command is pretty simple. You can just do like what's called the singularity build. Um, and let's say you have like your pipeline um, that's typically running locally, right? Like in this case, ping was written in R, 
And so it's going to be just our script and then the name of the script. Um, and the way you want to use, um, if you want to run it through this container, you can actually use both the SIF and the input fastq um, as inputs in the command line. And if this is how it looks like when you're typically running your pipeline, you know, it's just R script, or if you if it's like a shell script, then just sh or bash, followed by the name of the script. Um, all you need to do is have like three additional words in, on, in front of it that basically says, hey, I want you to execute my pipeline um, through the container. It's, it's as simple as that. So one, one question that popped up when, as I was working on this, is that why can't I just upload the, the .sif file to the repository? You know, like, why can't I just upload this? Why do I have to go through building the container? Or like, why do I have to give instruction um, for user? Why can't I just put the .sif file in my GitHub repo, for instance? And the main reason is just mostly size limitation. If you try to push sizes that are like over 100 megabytes to GitHub, it's going to complain. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Git LFS. It will let you push file up to two gigabytes, and that's still a limit. Um, the size of containers that I've worked with, the SIF file, it varies, but I've encountered um, containers up to like four and five gigabytes. So, but even if your container is less than that, I think it's generally recommended for you to not have your GitHub repo to be bloated um, in terms of storage. Um, GitHub typically recommends you to have it less than one gigabyte in terms of total size. But if you still want to some upload it, your, your .sif file or your container somewhere, um, Singularity has something similar to Docker Hub. Uh, it's called Scilabs, um, where you can you know push your image um, and then Whoever need, wants to use it, you, they can just pull it right away. Um, the only downside is that it only has 11 gigabytes worth of storage. I believe if I think if you pay more, you probably get more storage. But yeah, this is just like one of the alternatives um, instead of actually making the user build their container itself. So another question that pops up as I was developing. Um, you know, different tools and containerizing is that what if I need multiple Python in my pipeline? So in this case, there are two amazing tools, um, Amos and Bragtag, that require a different version of Python. So Amos needed to be installed in a Python 2.7 environment, whereas Bragtag is like in, in Python version that are like greater than three. And this is a, actually a problem with one of the pipelines that we are developing in our lab which is called image constructor. This was developed by Kristen Wade, one of our wonderful postdoctoral scholar. Um, this is a short read de novo assembler for the MHC region. So for those of you who might not be familiar, MHC is actually one of the most variable region in the human genome, which makes the problem of um, de novo assembly even, uh, even more confusing. But in this tool in particular, that's what we're trying to address. And this is where we actually use those two different tools that I was mentioning earlier, the one that has two different Python versions. Um, and one way to address this is by using what's called uh, utilizing something that most of you are probably familiar with called Conda, where you can differentiate your system Python with other Python installations. So you can have you know, Python 3.7, or you can have Python 3.8 installed in one of the environments. Um, you can also do this with other tools as well that are offered by Conda. So you can have multiple R or Java version um, in, in different um, instances of environment. And so integrating Conda and Singularity is actually a viable option. Um, and the, the, I think the concept is pretty, pretty basic in that inside your Singularity container, you're just going to have your first Conda environment where you want to specify when you're creating that environment, like, hey, I wanted to have a Python 2.7. Um, and so that being said, you will be able to install Amos. And you basically would just do the same thing for a second Conda environment, where you specify um, the version of Python um, and then the tool that you want to install. And the nice thing is that you can actually, there's seamless switching between one Conda environment um, and the other. 
because the, the pipeline that we design is meant to run from end to end. In the middle of the script, we can easily just switch from one Conda environment into the other. And so we can just you know use Amos and RegTech um, in places where, where we need it, basically. And so that brings me to my conclusion. The first one being that Singularity offers a reliable solution for bioinformatics software um, that is catered for use in HPCs. So HPCs are probably utilized by lots of researchers from all around the world. Um, <coughs> utilization of container platform removes the need for investigators to install multiple dependencies. So I personally, as someone with a little bit of a bioinformatics background, have struggled of, or been frustrated trying to install like a really interesting tool um but you know I, I can only imagine what would be the case if if someone who is not necessarily inclined in terms of software look at our tool and then are interested in it but then just struggle trying to install different libraries or system packages so by containerizing we kind of like help them along the way trying to make things as simple as possible you know and uh, my third point is that a more complex pipeline that requires multiple versions of the same package can be containerized with the help, conf uh, with the help of Conda. Um, in the example, I showed you uh, multiple Python versions, but you can actually do it with other tools that are offered by Conda as well. And just a reminder that doing all of this, it's basically to ensure that the integrity of our research are going to be preserved as, as time progresses. That being said, I just wanted to um, acknowledge um, people from my lab, for Kristen and Wes specifically, for the amazing pipeline that they develop. I have here the QR code for uh, these pipelines, for, um, if any of you are interested in either a Kier genotyper or um, a, an MHC um, short read de novo assembler. And I also just wanted to acknowledge that this is not, you know, this is not necessarily the best or the most optimum way to deal with reproducibility issues. So I would also love to get some feedbacks and or suggestions on how to turn this into a better effort because that's that's really what I'm trying to advocate for. And if you would like to containerize your workflow, but you felt like you know it's overwhelming, I have my email listed here. Uh, feel free to chat, and I'll, I'll I'll be happy to to help you throughout the process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rayo. Uh, with that, we have time for one question for you. Does anybody have questions? Someone is walking to the mic. Hang on a second. I don't think it's on. Thank you. Great talk. Um, I was just wondering, so it seems like your proponent of using one uh, container for your whole workflow. Um, why do you see the advantages and disadvantages versus using multiple containers, one for each step, and then constructing constructing a workflow, for example, in Widow or CWL uh, to define exactly you know your whole pipeline? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I think the, the main reason why I like to keep things um, in one container is just for the sake of, of simplicity. Um, so I know what people with uh, with without like a bioinformatics or like a software background typically struggle when they're trying to utilize different tools. Um, I, I like to have just one singularity container because um, the instruction for you to just build and run the, um, the, the pipeline is, is fairly simple, but uh, I have not yet encountered any technical challenges that would require me to use multiple container. Um, if in the future, there's pipeline that would I, I would need to containerize in multiple containers and then use like a CWL to integrate them. I think that would be a great idea as well, and it would be a great effort to um, to see how well can we um, document them so that it's easiest for for people to access our pipeline. Thank you very much, Rayu. Another round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.